Well, as you all know, we have a new board member, Maria uh, Rodriguez, Rodriguez uh, who will probably be joining us shortly. She brings a broad community background and we welcome her and uh, we'll have maybe more to say when she actually is able to join us. I will begin the meeting with uh, uh, considering the minutes. We have two sets of minutes. So uh, first of all, uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve the minutes of May 16th? So moved. Uh, Regina approved. Second? Dana. Dana. Second. All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. The ayes have it. We also have minutes from May 31st. Do I have a motion to approve? So moved. Regine, second? Second. And any comments? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Um, I spoke to Cynthia. There are no requests for public comments. So executive update, Michelle. Very good. And before I get started, we'll just do a call out. Um, Maria, have you joined on the call? There's one number I can't identify who it is. Okay. Um, well, this is our official annual meeting. So welcome, uh, Board of Trustees and public. We have one annual meeting uh, each year, and this is our annual meeting. I want to first start by thanking each of you for all you do on behalf of um, Maryland Health Benefit Exchange. We know that this is a volunteer board and that there's a huge time commitment for you and being um, participating and saying up to speed and when we have difficult conversations uh, to be had. And I personally, and I know I speak on behalf of the leadership team and staff, we really appreciate your dedication and your commitment to Marylanders and interest in bringing healthcare, affordable quality healthcare to all Marylanders. So we have just a little token of our appreciation Today, these are our new tumblers that um, we have gotten for special occasions. And this, of course, is one. So thank you very much. Thank you for our new swag. You're welcome. <coughs> uh, we will, before I close out, we will post the official board meeting minutes for the 2023 calendar meeting, and we will need the board to vote on that okay, to adopt those. Um, all right, so just a few things on staffing. We have a new employee, Tim Cook. Uh, Tim has joined us as our social media specialist in our marketing department. And Tim is a graduate of Salisbury University with a Bachelor of Arts in Journalism and Public Relations. He's worked in the communications industry for 17 years. Uh, he's a devout and loyal Baltimore Orioles fan. So uh, that will bode well for him. And, and he and Andy will argue about the New York uh, team versus the Baltimore team. Uh, and he also runs the Mid-Atlantic Wiffle Ball, uh, most competitive fast pitch Wiffle Ball tournament circuit in the country. So a little tidbit about him. So Tim is also joining the marketing team at a really interesting and fun time because on May 19th, the American Marketing Association, the Baltimore chapter held its 37th annual MX Awards. And Maryland Health Benefit Exchange uh, was awarded the best social media campaign uh, category. And uh, Andy uh, went and gathered that trophy for us. So we are really appreciative Betsy and her team, and everyone that worked on making uh, us successful in that. Just some information on the, um, oh, Tim, wait, there's Tim, if you can see him. Hi, thanks, Michelle. Yeah, I just heard you mention his name, so I thought I'd grab him. Hi, there's everybody. Tim. Thank Hello. you. So in terms of some federal and state news updates, uh, the biggest looming issue for us is uh, the expanded tax credits that were afforded under ARPA. 
And, you know, and it, originally we thought this was going to be a slam dunk. We thought it was going to be in the Build Back Better bill, which never went anywhere. Now it's been packaged in the reconciliation bill, and it's not a slam dunk. I think, uh, you know, every, as every week passes, myself and my counterparts across the country are getting more and more worried that this is not going to happen and it's not going to go through. Uh, what we're hearing is that there's a lot of competing priorities trying to get in the reconciliation bill, and there's some feeling that expanded tax credits should not remain in it. What it means for us is without those expanded tax credits, we can we pretty much guarantee we'll lose enrollments because it's made it quite affordable. Uh, so again, we're just doing as much as we can to educate people, to get as many folks as we know who have family, friends, or contacts in West Virginia to let Senator Manchin know how important this is. Uh, but there is a, a high level of concern right now. And of course, all the industry groups, um, whether it's the insurance administrators, the hospital associations, the uh, AHIP, the uh, carriers, everyone is advocating for the continuation of this. Uh, but it's, it's looking dubious as the days go by. And he's the hold up. Yeah. Um, well, well, to get the 50 votes in the Senate, expansion in cinema is what we're hearing. So, what's the top priority among those that are going? Well, there's in other, room? there's some Medicaid, additional Medicaid funding in there. Um, there is uh, environmental funding in there. So, oh, tax credits. A lot of good things in there. Mm -hmm. And it's just which one is going to. Uh, the public health emergency under Medicaid that did uh, get extended to July 15th, um, the federal government has said that they will give states 60 days notice uh, if it's going to be extended again. So we are fully anticipating that it will get extended to October 15th, and we fully expect that it will likely get extended another 90 days beyond that to January 15th to be beyond um, the election. So uh, here's Maria. Yeah, hello. Our, our newest board member has joined us and we can introduce um, her at this time if you like. Maria, are you there? Can you come on camera? Hello. Hi, well, good afternoon. Uh, Sorry, I'm a little late. Maria Rodriguez. Would you like me to introduce you? So welcome, Maria. We are so thrilled that you're here. Uh, the staff has had an opportunity to meet with Maria and give her an orientation. And the chair, vice chair, uh, and I met with Maria as well. We're really, I'm, I feel so grateful to have Maria uh, join the board. Maria lives in Frederick. And she has a small business uh, providing paralegal services and administrative services, um, notary public services to law firms. She also serves as the executive director of the Maryland Hispanic Chamber of Commerce and is very, very immersed in uh, the Hispanic community and will really help us open doors for us uh, in a segment that we serve, but we have not had representation at the board. So Maria, welcome. We are thrilled that you're here. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, so I'll continue on. Um, rates uh, have been filed. They are on average 11%. They're ranging from 7.2% uh, to 25.9%. So quite a range on average 11%. Now it's important to remember these are proposed rates only. The Maryland Insurance Administration will do their, uh, their work and their due diligence and, and uh, the insurance commissioner will approve the final rates. Uh, I did learn from the MIA that the rates as presented are, have considered that ARPA would be extended. So again, I, the worry is if ARPA is not extended, uh, lower in or lower age, lower age, healthier folks that normally 
may have bought health insurance will not, and that might affect the morbidity of the pool as a whole. Um, so those are you know, some of the federal things going on in the state uh, world. We have started the affordability work group. This work group met several years ago and out of that came the value plans that we introduced. We've now reassembled that group. They had their first meeting on June 8th, the second meeting will be tomorrow. And I think they're gonna have six meetings in total. And the charge of this work group is to continue to look at ways that MHB can improve um, the affordability of our health plan. So we're gonna assess the first year result of the young adult subsidy program and how that worked. Uh, they will look at the, uh, revisiting the vision plans. It was something that we've talked about having our vision plans and that people look at that. And then um, considering how MHB might adjust cost sharing to promote health equity. So those are three things that they'll be looking at. Uh, so we'll look forward to the recommendations out of the affordability work group. The second work group that's about to be started, this was a work group mandated out of uh, the session and that's our small business work group. So we've got a, a great group of 17 folks that will be joining that work group. We'll get that started, I think, in the next uh, few weeks. The other item, um, just that we had submitted comment on the proposed IRS um, legislation or on the family glitch or on the proposed regulation, rather, on the affordability coverage for family members, which we call the family glitch when it's affordable for the, the spouse, but not the family. So we'll wait to hear what happens on that and what the outcome is. Um, and with that, uh, Vice Chair McKay, that's all I can take any questions if there are. Yes, are there any questions or comments uh, on the uh, a remote? The room? Now we have a, uh, you were sent a uh, list of proposed meeting dates, uh, revised, I think, to take, uh, to uh, accommodate the new Juneteenth and a number of other changes that were made. Uh, are there any, you, uh, can, are you going to put them up for me? Thank you. Are there any questions concerning the meeting dates? There are none. I move to approve the board's 20, 2023 meeting dates as presented. Second. Second with uh, Mary Jean. Uh, any further comments or questions? All in favor say aye. Mm -hmm. Aye. Opposed? The ayes have it. Audit reports. Um, I'll start with the finance. It's, uh, unfortunately, uh, Singh is not able to join us. Uh, the finance committee met uh, with two major items on the agenda. Uh, the first was a review of where we are on our budget. And uh, I think it's fair to say we're doing quite well. And uh, uh, if anything, we're doing too well and running too much under budget, which has been a problem for us all along. And, um, spur as we might. We haven't figured out a way to get out from under that one yet, but we're still we're still working on it. Better than the opposite problem. And better than the opposite problem. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Considering the alternatives. Uh, we had a rather lengthy discussion on the issues of the uh, compliance officer and the role of the board in both overseeing and uh, involving itself in their management. There were a number of questions raised, a number of issues raised around the committee. I think at this point where we are is we're looking for more information, uh, more discussion about uh, what the issues are with respect to the compliance officer, how other boards uh, do their oversight of the compliance officer, and uh, what kinds of formalities we might or might not need to include, for example, in the uh, operating uh, 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 policies of the, of the exchange. So I think the, uh, the bottom line there is more to come. Uh, let me stop. Uh, Mary Jean, anything to add to that? Uh, then with that, I'll move on. And, uh, uh, well, Mr. Mr. Chair, if, if I could ask quickly. Certainly. I, I'm assuming the discussion is not is about the role, not the individual who's currently the compliance officer. 
Yes, that is correct. Okay, yes, I just wanted I, to get that clarification. <laughs> yes, and I had asked to disaggregate the role of the compliance officer from the compliance, the oversight of the compliance program as well, because they are two separate pieces. Got it. Okay, thank you. Dana, Standing Advisory Committee. Yes, the committee met on June 9th of this year. Um, key agenda items are follow. Um, Andy Ratner gave a report on uh, data for um, 2002. And among other points that he made, 2002, 2022. 2022. <laughs> Thank you for clarifying that. It says 2022 right here. But yeah. <laughs> um, um, points of particular interest um, in terms of growth, Maryland ranked fifth among the 18 state based marketplaces, growth of an in enrollment. So that, I thought that was great. Maryland ranked second along with New Hampshire in terms of average premium costs. The low, uh, we, the average cost for us in Maryland was 447 and the lowest which was 408. So we're doing really well. In terms of the gold plants, Maryland ranked fifth nationally in, in proportion of gold plans. And that's gonna be significant a little bit later. Um, also on the agenda was a, um, an update on the Prescription Drug Affordability Board by um, Andrew York, who's a far not only the executive director of the board, but also a pharmacist and lawyer. So he's pretty impressive. Um, our executive director, Michelle, presented on the status of the expanded tax credits brought about by the American Rescue Plan. Um, I will not repeat um, what Michelle's already reported to us this, um, this afternoon. Uh, let's see. Okay. We also received an update, um, an executive update by Michelle and an update by Johanna on the Young Adult Subsidy Program. The uh, leadership, the co-chairs of the um, strategic, no, excuse me, Standing Advisory Committee uh, expressed gratitude to the Health Equity Work Group for its outstanding work and its robust top quality discussions culminating in the final report on health health equity priorities. By a unanimous vote, the committee had accepted the report's recommendations. Now, um, I'm happy now to, oh, I should mention that um, the staff have taken those recommendations to heart and have incorporated them into the strategic plan. Now I'm happy to introduce, if she's on the line, I hope, Dania Palanker, who is a co-chair of the Health Equity Work Group um, who will present on the final report and recommendations. The floor is yours, Zania. Hello, thank you so much for having me. There she is, good. Um, so I first wanna just thank you uh, for having me speak today. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to have co-chaired this working group. I've actually been studying the issue in depth at Georgetown Center on Health Insurance Reforms and published a couple pieces on health equity and marketplace coverage through the Commonwealth Fund. So I was very happy to bring that expertise to this work group. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure that I can see my notes and the slides at the same time. Um, so I think it's really important that the marketplaces, um, including Maryland, are turning towards health equity. Um, you know, personally, I would say that providing equal access to health coverage is a very important part of, of equity, but it's not really enough to ensure equity. Um, and that sometimes there's a confusion between equality and equity. And, you know, this work group really tried to make that distinction in our work. Uh, one of the best ways I often think of to describe it is we've all seen that infographic of three people, I, most of you probably have, of three people trying to watch a baseball game over a fence. And, you know, everyone has one crate and, you know, that means the person of middle height can see over, but the, the 
person of lowest type still can't. And then you have where they sort of distribute them, you know, so that the tallest person doesn't have one, the youngest has two with that kind of idea of equity. And so we really try to focus, you know, beyond just providing equality of coverage in that. Um, and when I think about equity and talk about equity, my definition is really about ensuring that enrollees have a just opportunity to live as healthy a life as possible. So when it comes to the work group, um, just so you know, the work group met from August 2021 to December 2021. Um, and if you go to the next slide, we had 20 members that represented a broad array of stakeholders. Um, I just want to double check, am I doing the slides or someone else? Make sure. I am. Okay, so I, th I think the next slide has info on the members. So we there were 20 members and they represented a, a broad array of stakeholders. Um, including insurers, consumer advocates, and providers represent, representing geographic, geographic diversity across Maryland. And we had eight, eight meetings. And after the first meetings, we prioritized topics the work group wanted to discuss. We had guest speakers come join and present to the work group, um, including, and the QHPs, all issuers pre presented to the work groups. We looked at what other states were doing and together put together this packet of recommendations that were unanimously approved by all responding, by all responding members. Um, so, um, this, so this slide shows sort of all the members um, and who they were. Um, and on the next slide, um, we started uh, really by talking about race and ethnicity data collection. Um, and, you know, as a large part of it, um, just so you understand, the application does ask, as they are required to, um, about many demographic questions, including race and ethnicity, ethnicity being Hispanic, Latino, or not Hispanic, Latino, not. Uh, that's the federal law requirements, not all ethnicities. Um, and, and under federal law, applicants cannot really be required to disclose either. So there has to be an opportunity to not disclose that. So right now, um, there are less than 70% of enrollees that provide race and ethnicity data to uh, the marketplace. So it's missing for over 30% of the enrolled population. Just so you know, that's Maryland's not alone. That's about middle of the road for the state marketplaces. But it does mean that there, we, we don't really know the demographic makeup of a large part of the enrolled population, which means that you know, you can't, we can't perfectly target health equity strategies. Um, for, so for example, for Medicaid, in order for the, it to be considered of low concern, they want to have that data from 90% of the enrolled population. So we talked about best practices, um, which includes some action recently taken by the New York State of Health, um, the New York Marketplace, um, to revamp their application questions, which included making the question mandatory, but to have answers including prefer not to say and don't know. So people can't just skip it. Um, you know, that pushes some people to answer who might otherwise just skip. Um, and also some training and information for all the people who do enrollment and things along those lines um, to sort of encourage in, in an attempt to encourage the response rate and have the, the brokers, enrollment assisters, not just skip the question or not, or not downplay the need to answer that question. Um, so, you know, New York saw their response rates increase from 80% to 90% after they implemented their changes. So, um, you know, some of the, the changes similar to what we're recommending um, actually can really have a significant increase. Um, and so we recommend that the question should be, the race and ethnicity question should be redesigned, um, that there should be set response rate goals to work towards and other data collection strategies to increase response rate. And part of the work is having a data focused work group moving forward that includes discussions about insurers collecting this data directly from work group. That's part of what the DC recommendations have. California requires insurers to collect the data 
uh, directly from enrollees or getting the data from providers passed on to them so that every insurer has the inf information on 80% of enrollees at least. Um, and we also recommend this redesigning the questions on sex and gender to be non-binary inclusive, which is something that Washington State is working on. Um, next slide. So the next piece we talked about is the NCQA multicultural healthcare distinction. Um, so we recommended that all of the issuers receive this uh, new distinction. Um, NCQA is actually uh, moving though from the multicultural healthcare distinction, which is a few years old, to a comprehensive, what they're calling health equity accreditation. Um, California has updated their recommendations to be and requirements to be specific to the recommendation. DC uh, hasn't reworked their language, but they had they they are requiring the, the older language of the multicultural healthcare distinction. Um, and so hopefully there's a way, and that was discussed actually as a way that, you know, in an ideal work that potentially, you know, Maryland and DC insurers, you know, that if they, you know, if the requirement is the same in the two states because the you have the same insurers, that that kind of makes it a lot easier administratively for them. And it's not a huge hurdle if DC is already uh, going to require this. Um, so the NCQA accreditation includes, among other things, the required data collection, but also requirements on language assistance, cultural responsiveness, quality improvement, and reduction of healthcare disparities. Uh, next slide. We talked a lot about health insurance literacy, um, and particularly that it can be lower for certain marginalized groups. Um, and that the, to best improve health equity, we want to ensure that all enrollees understand how their health insurance works. So we recommend partnering with community organizations to be able to develop, but also to have these organizations offer a, type, a health insurance literacy curriculum so that people, so that there's a way that uh, people can learn about health insurance literacy and that there are organizations doing helping to take this curriculum out there. Um, and there were some recommended changes to the website to help with plan choices, to understand utilization of benefits. Um, and that includes some changes to the chat box in addition to tool tips, enhancing the choose a plan and consumer assistant fact sheets to just make sure they're explaining in ways that we know that the applicants can engage with. And also conducting focus groups to make sure that, that the accessibility of the materials is tested, um, including uh, enrollees of color, enrollees of limited English proficiency, so that you're actually making sure that the populations that we want to be able to target for health equity can understand this information. Um, and as I, I mentioned, li limited English proficiency, it was raised that the Spanish translation of the MHBE website is problematic in many places. So we also recommended an audit of the translation of the websites particularly for Spanish um, and not just uh, an audit of the text, but also some search engine, the search engine optimization in Spanish, because there was also a mention that it, the website is not, was not coming up or was not coming up as one of the first um, options when uh, searching in, in some of the main um, web browsers in Spanish. Next slide. Um, so we also talked about the importance of community health workers. Um, that they play an important re role in reaching populations of color in Maryland and immigrant populations. And we felt we were in a place to make recommendations about what those requirements should be, but that we recommend continuing the discussion of alternative payment models that include community health workers. Next slide. Um, and so the next piece was reduced cost sharing for high disparity conditions, which were you know, particularly talking about cost sharing um, you know, some other states have, you know, very detailed standardized plans. Um, so DC Act for their 2023 standardized plans, they will have eliminated cost sharing uh, for most services to manage type 2 diabetes, and they hope to expand that to other conditions that disproportionately affect people of color. Massachusetts is doing something similar in their connector care program. Um, which is a program they have for plant, separate plans for people under 300% of poverty. Um, 
Colorado is doing something different, but doing no cost sharing on other services, primary care visits, mental health, prenatal and postnatal services in the standard plans in their public option, which are going to be plans offered through the marketplace. So other states are looking to do something like that. And so we wanted, to, we recommended sort of exploring the feasibility of reducing that high, co high cost sharing conditions, um, understanding that Maryland does work different and that you don't actually have a standardized plan. Uh, next slide. Um, and, then, and then another, piece that came up was implicit bias. And that um, part of that is that in order to show a commitment on health equity, a lot of members felt it was important that the organization uh, shows a commitment to the equity work and strives for health equity in all pieces of the work. Um, and as a part of that, we recommend implicit bias training for MHB staff supporting other state implicit bias work, uh, basically not starting from the ground up, but you know what other, what other work is out there, um, maybe making sure that, that, that the staff is participating. Um, and just continuing to explore ways that the staff can reduce bias at the point of care. Um, and we did note that MIA is integrating cultural competency into network adequacy regulation. So I think in one area where implicit bias comes in very strongly is at the point of care where the provider has implicit bias. And in some ways this can be addressed through cultural competency uh, uh, training with providers, but we know that, that since that was happening, we didn't wanna actively recommend it, um, but recognize that that was happening with MIA. So next slide. Can you stop and go back for a minute? Yeah. I have a question. Um, you're talking about monitoring, MHBE monitoring implicit bias at the point of care, which we have no impact on. Um, so I'm a little concerned about that particular recommendation. I mean, we can't influence how providers, which is the point of care, uh, mm -hmm. Right. So um, we were not active. We and basically we were recognizing it's there and we were recognizing it can be there in two ways. One is that there may be some implicit bias for, among the staff, um, because many of us who <laughs> try to do good in the world, you know, have some implicit bias, you know, no matter what. So that there's the training for the staff. And then the other side was that recognized, yes, we can't, MHBE can't control what providers are doing, obviously. Um, that there's requirements that MHBE can make of participating insurers um, and where some other states were looking that was talked about with some other states are requiring the qualified health plan, plan insurer that the insurers have um, have implicit bias training as a requirement for their network. So in order to be a member of a network of Care First in DC at, at some point in the future, because it hasn't happened yet, that you know those providers would have to go through an implicit bias training, um, which doesn't eliminate implicit bias at all, but it's a step, it's something. Um, but we did not, and I think it's more, we did not actually actively recommend that in this case, because MIA is looking at that work uh, within the network adequacy regulations. And that in Maryland, that's really probably falls more within MIA um, or that at least it's happening there. Um, but that instead sort of that, the work that's happening elsewhere in the state should be supported um, and if and when possible, and it may be very minimal support in some ways, but the other is just to explore the extent of uh, really what the qualified health plan carriers efforts are around implicit bias, because the carriers do play a role, like they, they have some role since they are providing the networks and some carriers are doing things above and beyond um, above and beyond uh, just implicit bias training. And so there's not a really strong active recommendation, I guess here, um, but really, but wanting to at least kind of keep an eye on what's happening both in network adequacy regulations and just what the carriers are doing 
Um, and then if at any point there becomes an opportunity that nobody has thought of before that MHBE can play in somehow helping that. It, it may arise, but I think at this point, we didn't really see a very, very active role for MHBE, but wanted to make sure it was on the radar. Okay. Um, and so um, then the next was, uh, really was just about partnership and collaboration. Um, and hold one piece was really to hold listening sessions with connector entities, community partners that work directly with consumers, consumers themselves, if possible, and to use those insights to inform future strategy. Um, one thing that was raised is that it might be important to compensate for participants if you're doing cons consumers directly, particularly if you want to reach um, lower income groups um, or groups that might have to, you know, that you know, might, you know have various work and child you know, di difficult work and childcare schedules. Um, the other was to continue to coordinate with MIA and other state agencies in this work. Um, and that just to keep an eye to uh, the ability and the potential to form new partnerships with community organizations to work on health equity work. Um, and then the final slide, um, um, I think really just comes down to the implementation status. Um, I'll, I'll, I will quickly note, just so people know, there was a lot of discussion about coverage for immigrants, particularly immigrants who weren't eligible for the MHBE coverage. And it was recognized and discussed that that is sort of outside of the scope and that this group can't <laughs> recommend that people who are ineligible for coverage become eligible for coverage. But that was, I just wanted to raise that that was an area of concern for a lot of people. Um, I think on implementation status, am I right that this is something that the staff is gonna take? That's right, yeah. yep. Um, so I just wanted to provide a quick update on where we are with these recommendations and to let you know that we are either in the, have implemented or in the process or have a plan to implement um, across the board. So with the race and ethnicity data collection question, we redesigned that and implemented that in the last um, month or so. And so we'll be collecting data to hopefully track that that's improving our response rates. Um, the NCQA multicultural healthcare distinction um, will be planned to include that in our proposal to the board regarding upcoming uh, future plan certification standards this fall. The health insurance literacy items are in our strategic plan and um, generally being led by Betsy and our communications team um, over the next year or two. And then on the next slide, um, we uh, are planning to dive into um, the rest of these over the next year or two as well, and specifically regarding the cost sharing for high disparity conditions, um, are discussing that with the affordability work group, as Michelle mentioned currently, and will um, again it includes a proposal to the board related to that in the upcoming plan certification standards. This fall. So I go ahead. Um, a, a correction, Dania, or I'm asking for clarification. You mentioned in terms of high disparity conditions, the cost sharing, specifically diabetes 2. The discussion in the committee, standing advisory committee, was for all types of diabetes, diabetes 1, 1 1.5, and 2. Are you now suggesting that the work group has changed its mind and just focusing on um, cost sharing, reduced cost sharing for only diabetes 2? She, she's muted. Sorry, me. I was That's just okay. trying to give some examples. I think I was mentioning okay. diabetes too is what the District of Columbia was doing to just give some examples so you know that other states are doing different forms of, you know, reduced cost sharing for conditions with as part of attempts to improve health equity. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Because that is indeed what the committee approved. Yes unanimously all of the diabetes. So my question is the financing of community health workers and is that proposing it come out of MHBE budget? I mean, typically right now it's, there's supported their community health workers provided by the insurers. 
and some many of the connector agencies. So, so the recommendation, as Tanya mentioned, was pretty high level. It was to explore how we could work with insurers to support community health workers. So this is really to kind of dive into that more and figure out what we may be able to do in FY24. Not there's no specific kind of plan on the table that we would finance out of our budget or kind of any shape of what that would look like, but really to dive into the exploration of that in FY24. Mm -hmm. Good. Yeah. Um, so, could you say a little bit more about the NCQA multicultural uh, healthcare distinction? What's embedded in that? And um, some of the NCQA distinctions. Yeah, so I mean, as I said, since we had, you know, the, the NTQA has since sort of shifted from the multicultural health distinction to the health accreditation program, which is similar, but a, a sort of has two levels of uh, work. It, it has, um, you know, what it has is it has requirements for insurers to collect data about the uh, about various demographic data that includes race and ethnicity. Uh, I think it's um, also age uh, and sex um, to collect that data from the enrollees. And I will note that, you know, getting from enrollees or it's, it's generally called, referred to as self-collected data, which also embedded in self-collected data is data that enrollees report, you know, that report when they go to a provider that that network provider then shares with the insurer because as part of the, bis, you know, the related business entities under HIPAA, they can share that information if it's for uh, care purposes. So they can share that information. So making to try to collect um, that data themselves so that it's not just um, collected at the point of enrollment, but that either, as I said, like trying to get it through providers or through, you know, anytime some, it, it doesn't require all these different ways, but I'm just providing some examples of the different ways insurers collect it is, you know, every time you call customer service, it might be asked, or if you set up the online portal that you can use on your, on the web or the app that you provide, you're asked that information. And so there's just more points of contact with that enrollee to try to get that information and improve that information. Um, but it also has um, various, it, it, it has some deta very pretty detailed requirements on language access, um, which includes, um, it includes uh, translation of materials, but also ensuring that the provide that there are providers that are providing adequate translation, providers that are providing what's termed culturally competent care. So that's beyond just being able to speak the same language, but um, trying to provide care that is a understanding of various cultures. Um, so, so those are some of the things it's, I mean, it's like 300 pages long. So it's, it's extremely long, um, the actual requirements, uh, but those are sort of the biggest pieces of it. Um, let me see if I, I think I may have left a big area out. Um, and I'll just note as well that the carriers were all on the work group. So they are, were part of this conversation. Yeah. Do they have relationships with NCQA? Yes. Yeah, so I'll note NCQA already uh, provides various um, certifications to health insurers um, that may be required by law or just they may do to meet certain quality levels. NCQA does a lot of quality analysis of insurers. So insurers are very familiar with NCQA and um, I know the federal government is looking at at potentially requiring this for um, qualified health plans in healthcare.gov um, and uh, um, the National Conference of State Legislators was looking at, um, you know, recommending that um, insurers get this distinction or if not, at least pulling parts out from a lot of the requirements. But it's something the insurers are very familiar with. And as I said, DC is moving to, is 
you know, going to be requiring this. So I think a lot of, as long as they're going to have to do it for DC, um, yeah, since it's the same insurers that are participating in the marketplace in both states, um, I think there was a sense that as long as things weren't more progressive in Maryland, that the insurers seemed to be happy with the work, happy to do it. Before we go forward, we've had questions here in the room. Are there any questions online or comments? Yeah, Mr. Chair, I, I had a question. Um, we have we have a process for plan design for the exchange, I believe. And I guess my question would be some of these recommendations be taken up by the group that does plan design. Yes, so um, regarding the cost sharing recommendations, those are being discussed and fleshed out in the affordability work group that's meeting over the summer. So that group will help us to refine um, and make those recommendations more specific. And then in the fall, in September, kind of over the course of the fall, we ask the board to approve proposed and then final plan certification standards for the following year. So we'll be coming to you with proposed standards for 2024. Um, so at that point, we will have a, a very specific list of proposals for the board to consider. Prior to doing that, we discuss them with the Standing Advisory Committee in August. And following the September board discussion, we have a public comment period, and then ask the board to vote on final plan certification standards in um, typically November. So there will be a uh, kind of much more engagement about the plan certification standards with the public and the board. Thank Secretary? You. Yeah, no, that's great. Uh, I, I also was wondering about the community health workers where rather than us trying to, um, uh, you know, find ways, it, it would seem like uh, when I hear that, it, it would be, it would have to do with the, you know, how this, the plans are designed, at least that's what I'm hearing, but uh, maybe I didn't understand that recommendation very well. Uh, but that was what I was thinking when I was listening to it. Yeah, uh, we, oh, go ahead, Donia. I mean, the recommendation, which I mean, was again, recommending, I mean, it was also knowing that there were work groups that work on this to look into it. Um, with the idea that to see if there's a way to have to reduce or eliminate cost sharing for certain services uh, for certain conditions that are more utilized by uh, by uh, targeted populations in um, in Maryland, in uh, particularly in rural part target populations that are enrollees of MHBE. Um, so that might be say, I, and this is a might be, you know, it might be, you know, eliminating cost sharing for for certain office visits, and certain medications for diabetes. Uh, but it's it was done with the recognition that Maryland is different than how the other states have done this because on the other side, the insurers in Maryland also then have to figure out on their own. Where are you going to adjust for that and raise costs? Um, whereas, like when DC and Colorado are doing this, it's sort of they're looking at the entire cost sharing of the plan as a whole. So it's it's a little more complicated in Maryland, uh, but the idea was to basically use the process that already exists in Maryland around these around um, around you know cost sharing requirements and to consider sort of ways to possibly re use reduced cost sharing as a way to improve access to health care and improve and therefore equity. Thank you. Uh, other questions on uh, online? Ben? So, uh, I, I mean, I think you mentioned at the outset the difficulty of collecting uh, race and ethnicity and the carriers uh, tell MHCC the same challenges. Did you uh, Think of uh, come up with any creative ideas to gather this because, you know, frankly, when you're applying for uh, insurance, one of the fearful uh, things that you go through even uh, is am I going to somehow be uh, discriminated against? And that's a point at which, uh, even though insurance the insurance market has changed a lot, you still are fearful about what information to disclose 
may be harmful to you. Have you did you discuss any creative ways to gather that in the course of care or self-reporting through other avenues that could be used? Because uh, I mean, I think you said 70 or 80 percent. What percentage of people on that come through the exchange report uh, race? Or yeah, uh, it's a, it's 60 some percent. So that would be good. A, a carrier that did that, in our judgment, would be giving we'd be giving that one a, a minus. Um, there are players in Maryland that can only get 30 percent. So it's good, but I think the idea of getting it through the enrollment process is daunting uh, for, for a variety of reasons. And are there, did you think of it other ways to get it? Yeah, so, so oh, go ahead, Don. I was gonna say, I mean, outside of the work group, I have personally thought a lot about this. I actually just, uh, I think it was one or two weeks ago, had published a blog post on, on this issue uh, with how marketplaces can get the data so um, for getting it at enrollment, um, you know, it's, you're not going to get to 100%, obviously, um, and you're not going to take it, you know, where, where Maryland is, you're probably not going to get to 90% by improving it at enrollment. But by looking at what New York did around writing a, a sample script for their navigators, enrollment assisters, and brokers and agents, and training of that group, um, I think is an important piece because a part of that script and that training is letting the applicants know why they are being asked so that there's trying to counter that concern that this is gonna be used to discriminate to instead inform that this will actually be used to improve care for all populations um, and, and the importance of having that. And, and when New York did that combined with, they, with you know, they reworded the question in some ways. And as I said, they didn't make it like you couldn't opt out of the question. You had to at least click, you know, choose not to answer or do not know. Um, and so those together increased from 80% to 90%. So that actually does get a good somewhere. Um, and then as you know, insurers are doing this around the country in all different ways. And I, I think some of the most um, I don't know if they're all creative ways, but I think it's just trying to get them from as many point of contacts as you can. So, um, as I said, you know, some asking it when people call the insurance company or ask, or, you know, that being a part of what's asked when you're setting up the app. Um, sometimes if you're, you know, setting up that personal app to be used, you might be willing to put share information there that you might not be willing to share someone out somewhere else, because I think there's just psychological differences we have about apps on our phone and we've gotten used to sharing personal information on those apps. Um, you know, so there's that piece. Um, and then, as I said, trying, and then trying to get it, get that data sharing with providers, because a lot, a lot, of, a lot of providers do ask that information. And if they have electronic medical records, so particularly the hospital systems, the big health system, they do put that into a electronic system somewhere. Um, and it is pretty commonly reported. Um, and you know, yes, there's always going to be some people who don't report that, but a lot of people report that and probably even more in that instance because they're going to go see that provider and some of it is gonna be very obvious. You know, and you know, race is not always, but often something that uh, people just are going to assume the provider is going to be able to see. Um, Latino, not Latino, you know, it's very you. depending yeah. on the interaction. But so I think it, and so I think it's just like the combination of each one and as many of those as possible. Um, and that's really what California is working with. Vote on this. I think we need to move on. Yes. Um, if there's more we need to discuss, we'll reschedule. Uh, thank you very much for your presentation. Thank you. And um, we move on to our next topic, which is the young adult subsidies. Johanna, you're here. Could you do a sentence or two on the young adult subsidies for us folks who lose the thread? Yep. So just background, um, we've got a two-year pilot program. We can spend up to $20 million per year that was authorized by the legislature that's coming out of our state reinsurance dollars, um, not the federal pass-through, but the state 1%. Um, that 
uh, also comes through the insurance program. We're in the first year of that program and 2023 is the second year. So we had um, presented to the board, I think the last meeting on uh, proposed, one proposed change to the program for 2023 because the board has the authority to set the program um, eligibility and payment parameters. So we have one proposed change. And so we're gonna be asking the board today to approve um, a regulatory change to reflect that change and then also to approve uh, an update to the parameters to reflect that change for 23. We can go on to the next slide. So the one change, um, and I think I mentioned this briefly at our last meeting, is there was a provision tucked into HB 937, which passed this last session, which directs the exchange to use uh, the state subsidy to cover the non-essential health benefit portion of premium for individuals who would have a $0 plan, but for the fact that they have to pay $1 or $2 for their plan because APTC and currently the state subsidy do not cover that non-essential health benefit portion of premium, which um, comes into play if a plan covers abortion care, adult dental or adult vision, all of which are non-essential health benefits. And, not, uh, you can't use your federal subsidy and currently can't use your state subsidy to cover them. So the bill directs us to use the state subsidy to cover them so that you can have that $0 plan. This is only a subset of enrollees who are low enough income that they would otherwise get that $0 plan. Um, and then directs us to track the impact of doing so with the idea to you know, explore, does doing this improve the enrollment improve the number of people we get into coverage because we're taking away this small barrier? Um, does it reduce termination rates because people aren't being terminated for not paying the nominal amount? So that's for 2023. We have an estimate of the cost. Yes, uh, I think I included that. It's uh, somewhere in the range of about $400,000. So fairly nominal, we can definitely absorb it um, with the state subsidy costs. If we go on to the next slide, um, you'll see here the regulatory language change that we're proposing. We shared this with stakeholders for a preliminary informal public comment period and didn't get any feedback. So I think it was pretty straightforward. Um, and we also shared the proposed regulations with the board and your board materials. Um, the next slide shows our timeline. Um, and essentially, uh, we're just on a path to finalizing these in October. So the goal today is for the board to vote to approve the proposed publication of the proposed regulations. Um, those would get uh, published in August, and then we would have a formal 30-day public comment period. Okay. So we're just approving the publication. Yep. Okay. So can we? First of all, let me ask if there are any questions on this item online. Are there any questions or in, in terms yeah, of? Yeah, I, I, uh, I have a secretary. Yeah, did we have this ahead of time to look at? Because I'm trying to follow the logic of what it's being asked. I, I understand yes. the regulation process that I'm not worried about. I mean, what, what are we approving for a reg change? Yeah, if you'll go back to the previous slide. So um, this is pursuant to state legislation that directs us to update our regs as, as we're doing here. And the update to the regulation is um, to amend the way the payment parameters for the state subsidy. So the enrollees with a 0% premium contribution, which in effect is enrollees of any age who are eligible for the adult subsidy, so 18 to before and below 150% of the federal poverty level, or up to age 31 and below 200% of the federal poverty level. People in that age and income bracket currently have a $0 expected contribution. I will caveat that that's with the American Rescue Plan in place. If the American Rescue Plan goes away, those people will no longer have that $0 expected contribution because they won't get the additional federal subsidies and this will kind of be a moot point. So we'll see what happens with that. But assuming ARPA continues, um, that age and income bracket qualifies for a $0 expected contribution. And for people in that bucket, we would allow the young adult subsidy dollars to cover their non-EHB portion of premium, which is typically somewhere between $1 and $2. It averages about $1.30 per person. 
So this will remove a nominal payment that they currently have to make. So instead of having to pay $1.30 for their first month's coverage to effectuate coverage and pay that $1.30 every month, um, this state subsidy would cover that $1.30 or you know, whatever it is particular to their plan. Um, and they wouldn't have to do that themselves. And Dennis, to answer your question, these, this was sent out with the board packet of material. So you have that as well as the proposed uh, regulation in a separate document. One last right. question. One last question. Uh, if the American Rescue Plan is not continued, then some subset of this group will start to pay, will require to pay a premium. Yes. And if they do so, then are they dropped out because they're not 0% anymore? So really everyone is paying a premium because some people, because they have that dollar 27 or whatever it is currently. So people are accustomed to paying a premium now. Um, so their premium will go up if the American Rescue Plan Act ends, um, but for the most part, they won't be going from zero to something. They'll be going from something low to something higher. Um, if the ERPA continues and this goes into effect, they'll go from nominal to zero. Okay. Okay. Uh, any further questions or comments? Therefore, I move to approve the proposed young adult premium subsidy regulation updated for publication in the Maryland Register as presented. Second. Uh, second, Dana. Any further questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Go ahead. Thank you. And the next um, element is these are connected. Um, so we are also asking you to approve the program parameters, um, which is essentially here you see the 2022 parameters, um, which you're familiar with, age 18 to 34, ineligible for Medicaid, below 400 percent of federal poverty level, and we reduce the amount that you're expected to contribute towards your benchmark premium by a certain percent depending on your age and FPL with the most generous subsidies going to the youngest, lowest income in the cohort, and the, those scaling out as you um, go up the ladder of age and income. So this is the current program parameters for 2022, which the board approved last spring. Um, the, we're also asking the board to approve uh, 2023 final parameters. So we presented this to the board last month as proposed, published it for public comment, received no public comment, and are asking the board to propose uh, to finalize what we had proposed. So on the next slide, this is really a repeat of what I shared that we're making the change through reg. The timelines are just not quite synced up because obviously regs take a while to finalize. Um, but we're asking the board to approve uh, the, to maintain the 2022 parameters for 2023 with the one adjustment that I previously described to cover the non-EHB portion of premium for enrollees with a 0% expected contribution. And you can see here the highlighted individuals who would fall into that bucket, as I said, 18 to 34 under 150% FPL, um, 18 to 31 under 200% FPL. Are there any questions online? Are there any questions in the room? Um, if there's a three sentence answer to this question, go ahead. <laughs> if not, we'll consider it later. With ARPA in effect, it costs us more than if ARPA goes away. Yes. Um, can you go on to the next slide? I'm sorry. You want to jump in? Am I um, getting ahead of us? Okay. So the three sentence answer would be ARPA is currently. Oh, actually, go to the previous slide. So if you look at the under 150% FPL group with ARPA as it is, those people have a 0% expected contribution because the federal subsidies are fully covering their costs. So there's no state subsidy cost to those people because they're fully federally subsidized. If ARPA goes away, those people will start having to pay and then they will start receiving some state subsidy to reduce the amount they pay, which is why 
our costs increase with all of that. But our costs go down. It goes from 17.9 to 17.6. Oh, it's, it's the next slide. Next slide. Is that the case? Uh, oh, you're right. Okay, so the per person amount increases, but the total cost decreases. And that's a function you can see we're anticipating lower enrollment without our cost. Ah, thank you. We, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Oh, no, that's yeah. it. That's it. All right. Uh, I think the next slide has the. Right. I move to approve the final uh, young adult premium subsidy parameters for plan year 2023 as presented. First of all, are there any? Uh, do I have a second? Okay. Second. Are there any questions or comments online? Are there any questions or comments in the room? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Johanna. Thank you. Fulfillment services. Heather, let me again ask you for those of us who lose the thread every once in a while to mention what fulfillment services are? <laughs> sure. So fulfillment center is um, what we call the entity that provides our printing um, and mailing and inbound mail processing services. Um, so think of it as printing and mailing. It's the easiest. Um, so interesting you should ask that because here it is on the slide. We print and mail consumer notices as well as the tax forms, voter registration forms when people want those by mail, the MCO enrollment packets, and most recently Medicaid cards are also going through our fulfillment. Um, and they receive and process incoming mail, which also includes returned mail. And have a number of our tax forms gone down? With the rate changes? Well, yes. Be, oh, tax down with the rate changes. No, um, the reg changes. Oh, the reg changes. Yeah. So um, we no longer have to send out the 1095 Bs. Mm -hmm. So that did save quite a bit of money the last two years. We just send out the 1095 As, um, which the tax filer needs to reconcile their tax credits. But the 1095 Bs that were for Medicaid consumers, we no longer send out. Um, we issued the RFP for the Fulfillment Center contract on March 18th. It was out for, I think that means 31 days till April 18th. Um, and it was for one two-year base term with one two-year option. <laughs> and the reason we did it that way is that this year we felt a little bit like we were drinking water from a fire hose because we had so many things coming up at once, the call center, fulfillment center, connector entity grants. And so we're working on sort of balancing those out. So call center five years, this one four years, connector entity grants three years, um, so that in the future we won't have so much to deal with at once. Um, we did just get one bid, which is the current incumbent art and negative graphics. Um, the, and I have an NTE amount here, um, which you'll know is um, higher than what we've been paying. Um, and it's 5.8 million, which includes estimated postage, which is now a pass through of 932,000. And the funding split is a little over 50%, uh, 56% for the federal portion and the state funding is at 44%. It's the other way. Now you tell me. <laughs> I'm sorry, I stand corrected by our uh, CFO. So the funding split is federal 44% and state 56%. And next slide, Cynthia. Um, so because we received just one bid and with a higher per page price than the current contract, we did want to do some work on um, on whether we thought this was acceptable to bring to the board for approval. So one thing we did was we solicited feedback from other state-based marketplaces to try to get a sense of what other people were paying. It was, um, we put the call out uh, through our listserv. Um, we had three responses, one from Connecticut, one from New York, and I think one from Washington State. 
And unfortunately, they were a little inconclusive because one of them is still paying pre-COVID rates. Their contract hasn't um, expired and is ready for a new one. Um, the other one, New York, has an enormous volume. I mean, compared to us, the volume is just so tremendous that, of course, their per page rate is lower. Um, the other one was kind of more comparable, but they are facing a 13% increase right now. They're sort of in the same boat we are in terms of their costs going up. And the feedback we're getting, um, both from our vendor and from other people in the industry, is just the costs have gone up, as we all know, through inflation and those labor costs. So paper has gone up, ink has gone up, envelope, labor, everything. Um, we did also solicit feedback from other printing agencies, other sorts of organizations who do this kind of work to see what we could do to interest additional companies in responding to the Fulfillment Center RFP. And I think Tony put some of that um, discussion into the memo that the board has. I will note that the incumbent vendor has been an excellent partner. They've been working with us for several years. They always meet our SLAs. They provide tremendous value for the services um, we ask of them. And, um, and often we need something quickly or we have an ad hoc notice that gets to go out or we want to put something on colored paper. I mean, they're very, very responsive to us. Um, so we do ask the board to approve the award of the Fulfillment Center contract to Art Negative with an NTE amount uh, for FY23. I'll be back next year for FY24. Uh, NTE amount of $5.8 million. And you'll see your motion, motion six, I think, there. First of all, questions or comments uh, online? Is there a reason why we can't approve the two years of the contract? Same time? The, the option year is totally up to NHPE, but not. So let me make sure I understand then. It's a one year contract with a one year option? No, it's a the base two years. Right. And so what, what I'm asking is why can't we approve the two base years now? I think you can. I probably. Um, did not articulate the motion as well as I could. What I was looking for was an approval of the award of the contract, A, and B, a not to exceed amount of 5.8 million for FY23. Um, maybe that should have been two different motions. I'm, I'm not the motion expert, but, um, but that's what I'm looking for. An award of the contract to Art Negative and then an NTE amount approval. Um. I guess I'm a little concerned. I guess what I would like to ask is that uh, I'll support the motion, but I'd like to see a discussion next couple of times uh, whether this has to be in one single contract or whether if whether we would get bidders if we broke it into smaller pieces, since these aren't interconnected, that is, they don't need to exchange information. You're going to mail something out to every Medicaid recipient. Okay, fine. Does it have to be one, or can it be like some of our other IDIQ contracts, in which we have multiples? And why, what's the, uh, what is the uh, pluses of the pros and cons from the point of view of management? What is the pros and cons, what are the pros and cons from the point of view of um, of cost uh, to the agency? If maybe if we had two or three applying for some of them. We might be able to um, keep our costs down a little bit. So I'm. I, yeah, that's an interesting idea. I mean, my wheels are turning on it, but um, I think there are some challenges to it. But I think it's worth having um, a deep dive on. So we'll see what we can do. Clearly, yeah. clearly Venkat's methodology is quite different. He has a bunch of IDIQs, and he goes to now. Those are individuals. I don't know exactly the same. But, it's, but the principle would be the same. So anyway, I think just a report coming back in the next, uh, you know, several several cycles, and we'll we'll talk about it then. Sure. Uh, any other questions online? Yeah. And in, in the room. How much of an yeah. increase this over uh, the twenty twenty two bid? Is there a way to characterize it? You talked about it being higher, but how much higher? Twenty twenty two is going to be about one point eight million actual costs. And this is significant. And this is five. Yeah. It's a lot. 
Is it the five for two years? So at the end of the at the end of the first year, there could be a, a rate increase. The NTE. The cost is the cost is by volume of notices. Um, so the costs go up and down depending on how many notices we're sending out. But the underlying the rate per unit stays the same one year, two year. No, the, with the BAFO we sent out, they have rates for year one, year two, and the two option years. Also, okay. So those rates are in the. Uh, but there's, they're built into them. Okay, yes, sir. Um, anything else? Yeah, Tony, I had a question. If I might. Yeah. Yes, Mr. Secretary. Yeah. So, it it looks like this is triple the current contract, and I'm wondering. I I thought I, in the letter I read that the the uh, assertion that. Part of the reason might because might be because we are printing far less volume than what we used to, so that even means it's even higher per page, I guess. So it uh, doesn't it doesn't feel uh, right for some reason. And isn't there a fair amount of competition in this particular industry um, that we should be seeing? I I'm always a little suspicious when there's only one vote in a high, you know, in a, an industry that has a lot of players. So what I did is I called, um, I have a friend who works in the printing industry. And basically what she said um, was the fact that all the compliance requirements with the SOC 2 type 2, with the federal, um, federal information, RZ and all the compliance issues, kind of very few companies um, handle that. If they if they do want to handle that, it, the person said that, for instance, their company, <coughs> they would have to go out and make an investment in, in equipment and, and uh, people in order to in order to accommodate it. So the main thing was. As far as the other, what I was told was a lot of these smaller printers and fulfillment companies went out of business due to COVID, number one. Number two, there was probably only about a handful of uh, printers slash fulfillment companies in the area that can accommodate our needs. Um, and basically, mm. so and it's, it's not the print. That was written into the RFP. There was a distance required. 100 miles. Yes, 100 miles. 100 miles. So the issue is not the printing issue. It's, it's all the uh, associated with having to do business with us. Uh -huh. Yeah, and, and, they, and I'm not knocking the state of Maryland, but that was, <laughs> that, I was told that was viewed as a negative also, um, dealing with the state of Maryland. Or maybe it's, maybe it's all compliments, but. Yeah, probably. The secretary? Yeah, no, I I guess the other thing is, for, uh, what what is our budgeted number for this service in our twenty three budget? Our budgeted number for FY twenty three is three million dollars. Three point five. Three next year. Um, so, one thing that I spoke to Heather and and, and Leanne about is the possibility of more people receiving their notices online as opposed to through the mail. And right now, that's kind of what's been increasing the volume is, is number one, not having to send out the 1099As, but number two, oh, 1099Bs, but number two, also um, people receiving them electronically. So we don't have to use, but they don't have to print them out and send them through the mail. You send them a, a uh, mug if they do it. <laughs> We did um, a couple of years ago make a change in the system so that people, as they're going through the application, are opted into paperless, and you actually have to select that you don't want to be paperless. Um, but but it's yeah. I mean, and we did actually this year for our notices add an additional sort of uh, text box on the top of the front page of each notice that says something along the lines of, um, you know, go paperless, it's fast, it's easy, and, you know, you get it right in your inbox um, to try to encourage people to 
So we'll continue to work on ways to have more folks be paperless. I'm sure the requirement too, that there's like two pages of in the different languages. So, and that's a requirement. Um, I think we understand. Um, any other questions or comments? Councilor, make sure that, yes, go ahead, Dana. Um, for next year, you're, you're asking us to approve something for 5.8, is that it? For this year? For this year. Next year, do you know, will it be the same? It will depend on the volume. The rate per page oh, no, yeah. is slightly different because they gave us, um, a, the bidder gave us a rate for each of the four years, the two base years and the two option years. Um, but really the final price depends a lot on volume. Yeah, for, for matter, it's two cent increase per page. Um, and it depends on the volume. So basically from base year one to base year two, it was a two cent increase. So going back to Mary Jean's suggestion, maybe can't do it, but um, I kind of like the idea of doing it for like the two years, but if we don't, do we have to know the actual amount to approve it? Or can we say estimated for, over this period? No, well, my understanding is that you can approve the award of the contract and then separately approve the not to exceed amount for FY23. In any case, we would be back before you next year to ask you to approve a not to exceed amount for the following fiscal year. Well, and I think her point was, why not do this year and next? And at this point yeah, in time, it's, it's not a motion. Late, yeah, so we might as well just- Because I think, you know, I, I would very much like to have a further discussion uh, along the lines the secretary raised, along the lines that I've raised, um, that uh, is this the best, vehicle method. Uh, obviously, at the end of the first year, we can we can terminate at the convenience of the government. There's a penalty, I know, but we, we have to deal with it. But the fact of the matter is, I'd much prefer us to have an understanding about what we're going forward because the, the one contract, the one the one bidder is an issue. Uh, that said, uh, Councilor, make sure this one's okay. Um, I move uh, to approve the recommendation to award the fulfillment center contract to art and negative graphics for a four year term. It's a two year base, two year option. For a two year base, two year option term, and to approve the not to exceed amount of 5.8 million for FY23 as presented. Second. Second, Mary Jean. Any further comments or questions online? Yeah, uh, I don't mean to prolong this, but uh, and I'll I'll vote for. Uh, is there a way, I, either to amend this or to ask separately that we do an operational analysis of this process for you know got two years, two years from now we should have a better way of doing this that's less costly. So. I, I'll, I'll vote for the the motion, but I I just uh, I wouldn't want this to go on for another year and a half without some work on this matter. Uh, Mr. Secretary, um, maybe what we can uh, we talked about is we're going to have a report back here in I take it two to three sessions from now. It'll go through the structure of how we might go at it differently. Okay. Uh, and uh, uh, you know whether we break it up into other little pieces or or use some other methodology and maybe we can involve some of the external uh, resources we have. Great, that's fine. Thank you very much. Mr. Okay. We can also consider whether we want to use a printer that's farther away. I mean, in the first year of the exchange, we really wanted the printer to be close by so we could run back and forth. That may become, that may have been less it may be less important now, particularly that we're in such a virtual environment. All right. so, that, so you all have an agenda. Uh, with that said, unless there's any further comments, all in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Porticon. Porticon? Oh, wait a minute. There's two under this. One is language. Oh, language lab, excuse me. <laughs> No problem. The board has met Tracy Gamble, our procurement officer, I believe. 
So language line, um, you uh, will recall from prior years that we utilized the Maryland state contract uh, with language line services through the Board of Public Works. Um, and we generate a purchase order from that state contract each year. That BPW contract is a five-year contract, which ends in 2024. Um, Right now, um, I'd like to seek the board's approval to generate a purchase order through the BPW state contract um, in the not to exceed amount of 450,000 for FY23. Um, I apologize again, my funding split is probably backwards here because I copied it from the other slide. The funding split is 44% federal, 56% state. Um, I did um, in the memo I provided to the board uh, let you know that we will be issuing an RFI for language line services. I think, I think there may be a way to harness some technology to help us with um, interpretive services um, that can both save us some money and, um, and perhaps improve the experience for our customers, but I need some time to do that. There's been a lot of excitement at the exchange this spring. <laughs> so we'll issue that RFI in the next couple of months and, and come back to you hopefully with something that's a little more efficient than this. Um, but next slide. MHB requests. Hold on a minute. I'm sorry. No, I want to say right here. You get ahead of me. All right. Well, before we read the, uh, the uh, motion, uh, are there any questions online with respect to this item? Are there any questions in the room? Um, I assume you're talking to the, uh, the folks about the health equity and language issues. I mean, those things are relatively We've connected. We've been in some, some involved way. in the recommendations okay. from the health equity board group. Tracy, do your thing. <laughs> MHB requests that the board approve the request to secure language line services through the state contract with the Board of Public Works and the not to exceed amount of $450,000 for FY23. Tracy has stated my motion. Do I have a second? Second. Second. Uh, are there any further questions or comments? I did, I had one question, Mr. Secretary. Secretary. Yeah, how many languages do we normally find need online? Is it five, 10, 20? I didn't hear the question. How many languages do we? How have? many language line languages does language line offer? How many do we use? Well, how much to start do with? Use? Have, roughly. Yeah, they have two hundred and fifty languages. Oh. How many do we use? Well, in theory, all of them. Do you have any statistics on how much has been used? Oh, by? um, it's primarily Spanish, followed by Korean. Oh. Um, and then very small amounts of other languages after that. Um, one of the things that we did um, in the new call center contract and also with our new connector entity grant was to provide um, minimum numbers of bilingual speakers for both the call center and our navigator program. I'm hoping that that would also uh, bring down some of the language line costs by having um, those numbers built into the contracts. Um, but I wanted to be careful not to suggest that we're unhappy to be providing these language line services, because obviously to the extent that people are finding us, particularly people who speak English as a second language or know English at all, we want them to find us and we want to provide these services. So it's not necessarily a bad news story. It's, yeah. All right, you've heard the... Uh... You've heard the uh, motion, my motion. Are there any further questions or comments? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now, Cordicon. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman, Secretary, members of the board, and everybody. Today I'm joined by our procurement officer, uh, Tracy Gamble. Uh, thank you, Cynthia. If you could please move to the next slide. Uh, today I'm requesting, we are requesting the board um, to uh, extend the contract of Corticon business rules engine software for another year. This is a two year contract. And as the board uh, may already be aware of, uh, Corticon is one of the leading uh, rules engine software that the exchange has been using since inception. And uh, we use the software 
for um, creating all the business rules to Medicaid and QHP eligibility uh, and other eligibility requirements, and also to automate a lot of these transactions uh, when the consumer is seeking enrollment or eligibility coverage. And um, uh, even though we have been using this software for some time, um, I would like to just state to the book board uh, that we are reviewing this uh, particular product uh, as well as how this product has been patched together over the years. Uh, there are hundreds and thousands of rules built over uh, the years and uh, so we are thinking of uh, reviewing structurally and revamping uh, entire business rules engine in the coming years. Uh, but for now uh, we would like the board uh, uh, to extend the license and support uh, with that introduction, I will hand it over to our procurement officer to provide the procurement summary. Tracy. The current license period is two years and it starts August 1st, 2021 through July 31st, 2023. The approved reseller is vCloud Tech Incorporated. The cost of the quarter upon license for the two years is $694,116. The cost of the licenses for year one, which was FY22, was three hundred thirty-three thousand nine hundred and six dollars. The cost of the licenses for year two, which will be FY23, is three hundred and sixty thousand two hundred and ten dollars. Thank you, Tracy. The next slide, please. Yeah, thank you, Cynthia. And this. Uh, this is a slide to illustrate the split of federal and state participation and the total cost for the two years. And we are on the second year, requesting the board for the second year uh, license renewal. Next slide, please. If there are any questions um, before uh, our procurement officer requesting the board for approval. Um, let me be clear, the 694,000 is the 23 amount. No, 22 and 23. 22 and 23. But 22, we have, needs to be approved. 23. So the amount for 23 is? 360. 362. Uh, this is, a, Mr. McCann, this is a two year contract. Right. So first year is completed. This is the second year. Okay. We would like the board to approve um, for this amount so that we can extend the. Oh. I see the problem. The, the sent out number was 33,906 and it's now 362,010. The 333 was this year. Go on. We're still in 22. Yeah. So you might want to go back. Yeah. Right. I'm looking at the request for approval that I was sent out. Uh, Mr. Chairman, I, I apologize for the error. What you are okay, as long as it, that's fine, sorry. that's fine. Sorry. Okay, I go back to the motion, please. Okay. Will we do that? Are there any further questions other than confused vice chair? Uh, On the, I, online, any questions? I, I had a question for Venkat. So is this, this is for the rules, the Corticon software is for the rules engine. And uh, is the rules engine something that is uh paid for by cms and or is, and, and it's because I'm, I'm i'm you know getting into their whole thing about uh, uh they 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 have they want consistency in how we're uh using our rules engine so when the contract ends are, are, are they involved in reviewing this or do they have any expectations or could we go out and get a completely different rules engine in three years? Yeah, that, that's a great question, Mr. Secretary. The, the federal participation is at this time 75% for the software, uh, which is 88% of 75%. And uh, the expectation as per CMS original guideline at the start of the exchange was to, uh, as you may already know, uh, maintain the code modularity, keep certain components of the code separate. Uh, the rules falls under that. Uh, we can very well write the entire rules in our Java code. Uh, however, for the uh, for complying with that modularity requirement, we had to separate uh, for many other reasons as well. Uh, in technically, keeping the rules separate is really advantageous as well. 
our as to the product, um, this product had been pretty much ingrained into the exchange. Um, that's one of the things that I you know, worry about a little bit sometimes, but this is one of the best um, business out there for the rules. There are a couple of other options too. We will be exploring, constantly exploring those options as well, but having to change uh, dramatically uh, into a different product requires significant effort. Uh, however, if you are thinking about combining the entire Medicaid uh, rules at one place, uh, then probably that's a completely different thought as well. Uh, but your point is well taken. But at this time, um, our best alternative is to clean up uh, uh, the rules that have been built over the years. And eventually, if necessary, if CMS requires down the line uh, for us to consolidate the rules, um, uh, we, we should be able to reasonably easily do that. Yeah, that's great. I, and I'm kind of thinking down the road, as you know, uh, Subi is now our C, 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 uh, CIO for the department and we're working on the, uh, the um, you know, the uh, chain, you know, the, the Medicaid uh, transformation uh, with CMS. We may end up spending as much as 500 million to a billion dollars over the next decade with that modernization. So I, because the exchange is so tightly woven into Medicaid, I, I just wanna make sure that we're thinking in those terms. And I'm sure you and Subi will be having those conversations. So thank, thank you. you. Point as well, Jacob, thank you. Other questions online? Other questions in the room? Tracy. MHB requests the board's approval to renew the Portacon software licenses for contract year two from August 1st, 2022 to July 31st, 2023 through the approved reseller vCloud Tech Inc. And the total amount of $360,210 with federal participation amount of $237,739. I'm sorry, $237,739 and state participation amount of $122,471. Tracy has stated my, uh, my uh, uh, motion. Uh, do I have a second? Second. Mary Jean, again. Uh, online, any further questions? In the room, all in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The ayes have it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The strategic plan. And I have a hard stop at four, so. But we all. Okay, Cynthia, you're gonna cue me up. I'm gonna be presenting this one to the board. Um, next slide, please. So just a little bit on the process. Last June, actually June 15th, in the course of our regular quarterly offsites, uh, we were doing our strategic planning and we started to, to shift our focus from you know, we're in the startup mode for the first 10 years of the exchange, now moving into a mature agency. And so as we were looking at uh, designing our goals and our planning for moving forward, uh, we really thought at that time that it would be helpful to bring in someone from the outside that could walk us through the next three-year strategic plan, work with the board uh, and the leadership team uh, move forward in a, in a more formalized strategic plan. So we issued the RFP and then on September 27th, we entered into a contract with Quinn Strategy Group to provide those consulting services. Uh, between October 25th and March 31st of this year, we had numerous in-person and Zoom meetings uh, with uh, Anne, with the board, as a leadership team. Individually, we probably had well over 25 meetings. Um, then May 12th of this year, uh, the leadership team finalized the strategic plan and that's what we present to you today. Next slide, please. When we started, we went back and looked at was our mission and our vision and our values still aligned with how we felt we were operating? And obviously they really were. We uh, realized we needed to tighten them up a little bit, clean them up a little bit, and uh, of course, anyone who's gone through this process of talking about mission, vision, mission, value, vision, or mission, vision, values, or strategic planning knows that you could spend three hours alone on one word and <laughs> coming up with one word. 
So after many, um, many meetings and lots of discussion, the mission of the exchange, we improve the health and well-being of Marylanders by connecting them with high quality affordable health coverage through innovative programs, technology, and consumer assistance. Our vision is that everyone in Maryland will have high quality affordable health coverage. And we're driven by our values of being ethical, diverse and inclusive, innovative and collaborative. Next slide, please. So I'm not gonna read through this, but it is in the slide materials and it has been sent out and it's part of the strategic plan. And Andy and Betsy did a really good job outlining our history and putting it into that strategic plan so that we, we don't lose sight of where we came from. Uh, as you all know, this we all were, we began with the Maryland Health Benefit Exchange Act of 2012. I think, Ben, you were here since that very first time, and Tony, I believe you were too. Um, so the, the strategic, so at that point in time, um, it, one of the tenets was that if we are successful, we'll make healthcare coverage accessible to thousands of Marylanders who've never before been able to obtain health insurance uh, based on their, their uh, medical condition, the affordability. And as you all know, we've achieved that. We have really lowered that uninsured rate. We've got coverage through the expanded Medicaid program and through um, qualified health plans and through our dental plans for well over um, you know, 500,000 people between all those segments. So now the next thing that we need to look at and what we're moving forward to with is how we protect and advance all the initiatives that have gotten us to where we are today. Next slide, please. So we came up uh, with three strategic priorities. One very important is organizational strength. If we don't have our organizational strength, not, we can't do anything else. We can't move that needle forward. MHB will continue to build our organiz organizational strength to deliver our products, invest in our employees, and enhance board governance to advance our mission. This priority recognizes the importance of our technology platform to maintain security, privacy, and business value. At the same time, we recognize that it's our employees that are our strategic assets who must be developed, engaged, and motivated. And finally, we will continue to be a good steward of our financial resources, managing our resources in an ethical, transparent, and efficient manner. So underneath the strategic priority for this strategic plan, which is three years, we have five different objectives. One, we wanna ensure a comprehensive approach, approach to risk. Two, we wanna invest in our team's development and capabilities. Three, we want to ensure the continuation of a secure and stable financial position. Four, we want to strengthen the organization through data. And five, we want to cultivate strong board leadership and governance practices. Next slide, please. The second strategic priority is telling our story. We're going to continue to tell our story, promote our value, and highlight our results. We'll extend our outreach to ensure that we're communicating with Marylanders and community partners about our purpose and value. We'll develop relevant partnerships and collaborations to help with policy initiatives, accelerate the work of like-minded agencies, and support legislation that aligns with our mission. Our story will be supported by data that speaks to our results, impact, and accomplishments. And under this priority, we have three objectives. Expand our outreach, one, build and leverage our partnerships and collaborations, two, and support our storytelling with data, three. Next slide. The third strategic pri uh, priority is product growth. We recognize that the insurance marketplace and consumer needs are constantly evolving. This priority will ensure that we continue to address those needs with relevant products. We are committed to ensuring that our products remain available, accessible, and affordable to all Marylanders. And we have three objectives here. Expand to serve the small group market, 
ensure availability and accessibility of products and maintain product affordability. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to pull out from the strategic, uh, fiscal year strategic priorities. We've got the, the uh, goals and the objectives. And now these are our action items. So I've just pulled out a couple of slides of the specific action items we have in for fiscal year 23. Under policy and governance, monitor legislation each session that would establish new commissions and groups where our presence could be additive and engage legislators if we are not included as a member. <laughs> establish and maintain intentional meetings with HSRC, MHCC, Maryland Department of Health, uh, CRISP, which is the Chesapeake Regional Information System, MIA, and Department of Labor. And although we have very important meetings uh, with these other agencies, and I see we forgot one on here, which is the Prescription Drug Affordability Board, now that I see Andy back there, uh, that we work with all the time. And we really are working with them, but we want to be intentional about how we work with them and how we uh, drive the uh, issues forward. Reestablish a small business advisory group, analyze the impact of young adult subsidies to inform program continuation recommendations, uh, secure a consultant to help shape the reinsurance accountability efforts. We've been receiving data from the carriers uh, on their accountability efforts, but we really want to look at, all right, we've got this data, how do we use it to move the program forward? Create port board position description. Uh, form a board governance committee, which we've talked about. Cultivate relationship with the Maryland delegation to advocate for continued and increased federal funding. And again, we do these, but these are on the strategic plan to keep a focus on them. Continue to build relationships in the Maryland legislature to pro promote our impact, our work, and the need for state funding. And then implement the small business uh, subsidy work group. Next slide, please. Is it possible to get a copy of the whole plan? Yes, it was not in our, we'll send that out. We didn't send the I think plan so. out. So I saw where these slides. That's an oversight on my part. Cynthia, would you please send that out after the meeting? Yeah, because sometimes it's hard. You know, this is taken out of context. And I happen to really like context because it helps me to understand things. Now, that is, that's my oversight for not putting it in the folder to go out with everything. Send this for you? No, 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 the strategic. Plan. Yeah, okay, I was just saying, because I'll put this one out, gotcha. Um, and we actually have three documents, we'll send two, because the third one is not finalized, but we'll send this out. Okay, that would be really helpful. Yes, and it should have been. Um, well, you know, life happens. Yes, so under our human resource development, create time and resources for development, uh, research employee and employer relations that motivate and retain staff, such as permit hybrid schedule, leave policies, leverage contractual employees to supplement staffing to relieve workload. And by the way, these some of these are already in process right now. We've got things working on these well, actions underway. Reevaluate our IT staffing cost comparisons, uh, create a culture of customer service for internal audiences, catalog existing meetings, and then cross-pollinate. How can we cross-develop uh, our staff? One of the things we recently did uh, was we just got LinkedIn Learning, which is huge. It's opened up and expands about a whole bunch of learning opportunities. And again, we're tying the strategic plan into performance uh, or our, um, our PEPs. And again, tying that into the LinkedIn Learning terms of training recommendations. So all this will tie in together. Um, under technology and data, building disaster recovery site procedures, implement zero trust security model, catalog and refresh existing data reports, establish data work group to evaluate internal and external reporting, refresh key performance indicators to measure on and report on, defining our target audience, key messaging and data to support value and impact, and ensuring our annual managing for results report is meaningful and tells our story. And that's what we submit with uh, our budget. Next slide, please. Under outreach and consumer assistance, 
identify and implement additional outreach efforts, broaden involvement with brokers towards our outreach efforts, identify and develop health insurance literacy partnerships and materials. You'll see some of these run through threads of things we've already done, like the health equity work group. Access, um, assess increased use of grants to community nonprofit organizations to assist with outreach and enrollment efforts. Focus connector entity outreach to areas with high uninsured populations and neighborhood hubs. We built that into the connector entity program, which you approved uh, last month. And then under financing compliance, create line item for contractual employees annually. Again, a big push on this is to get more IT, that management layer of IT folks that we want to have in, as well as some other positions. Establish a strategy for prompt end user license agreement and non entity exchange agreements. Catalog exchange software license and subscriptions requiring the EULA reviews. And add Medicaid reporting to the implementation of plans, advanced planning document for funding. We do a significant amount of reporting for Medicaid, monthly reports, ad hoc reports. And we've never included that in the IAPD, so we don't ever get any federal funds for that. That comes out of the exchange state funds. So we've added that in so we can now get some federal funding for that as well. And then complete an external Department of Justice effective compliance risk assessment. So those are, um, that's everything in the strategic plan. I'll send that out. I will send that out today, right after the meeting. And I'll take any questions. Um, Mary Jean, let me ask you if you've got a mic. Do you have any questions? Yeah, the DOJ plan, which I thought we talked about last week, seems to be pretty punitive. Is that really the one we want to do? Well, the Department of Justice, well, I, that's something we could discuss further. I will say that there's a Department of Justice self-assessment, which is the one that the Chief Compliance Officer did for fiscal year 2021, correct, Kat? 21. And we are looking to get a consultant to, to do that assessment every year after. But that's something the Finance Committee could talk about. We can build it into the strategy. OK. Uh, other questions online? Um, yeah, if I could, Mr. Chair. Uh, I'm Michelle. Sure. I, I got to tell you, I, I was exhausted just listening to the list. So I, I had a question. Uh, are you are you at some point, are you going to ask the board to adopt this plan and then use this for compensation purposes or performance appraisal purposes? And do we believe that 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 the list uh, can I, I, uh, do we have a sense of priority and what kinds what things can get done when I could see if this was a three year plan where you're going to break it up into pieces but yeah I mean it's very ambitious so I applaud you for that but I I worry that it's uh, it might be a little too much I, that's just my initial thought so absolutely I will say that. Um, I had to hold the team back because there was a lot that everybody wanted everything in fiscal year 23 because that's how we work. We're, we're constantly trying to, to get things in. A lot of what's on here have already been worked on, we've been working on throughout the course of fiscal year 22. Um, Dennis, in terms of the board adopting it, um, these are, Again, we can absolutely do that. You know, the leadership team and I, over the course of the last five years, have set goals. We've reported internally on those goals. Uh, we've measured ourselves against those goals, put them in PEPs. Um, so we've been doing this for five years. This was just, okay, let's do a formal three-year. We'll bring it to the board. We'll incorporate the board into this, which we've done in the past, too, at the board leadership uh, gatherings. So I guess um, I'm open to the board if the board wants to formally adopt it. What you'll see in the other documents we've, um, when I send them out, we do have some in 24 and 25, but I, I can assure you, I feel very confident that what's in fiscal year 23 will get done. 
uh, just based on how our team operates. And I think seeing the rest of the documents would make it you know, more understandable how you're going to actually get this done. Mr. Secretary, would it be a good idea to say that let's take a look at the full plan and then maybe talk about that in the next or one of the next couple of sessions? Yeah, no, I I think it's a great plan. Uh, I, I don't have any disagreement with that. I, I just over the last 40 years, having done a lot of this kind of work, I, I found myself at one time just exhausting my team with too much and not having a sense of priority. So uh, I think this is all good stuff. I, I'm, and, and again, I'm, I'm willing to, I, I'm, I just pose the provocative question for my board colleagues and their thoughts on it. I, I don't have a strong feeling one way or the other. Are there any other questions online? Uh, in the room, Ben. Yeah, yeah I, I commend the uh, staff for putting this together. I, it would be helpful for me to think about separate the priority action items from the, from the hows and the whats, because I think um, the hows are important, but you know, the uh, key endpoints are really, I think, uh, important to focus on even more. Other questions or comments? Thank you. It is now four o'clock. I'll take a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second? Ten, second? Second. All in favor, aye. aye. We're aye. adjourned. Thank you all very much. <laughs> I kept everyone here for.